Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the service tonight. If you will, stand please, and let's sing number 336 in our hymn book. 336. It may be in the valley where countless dangers hide. It may be in the sunshine that I am peace of mind. But this one thing I know, if it be dark or fair, if Jesus is with me, I'll go anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, wherever it may be, if he is there. I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. It may be I must carry the blessed word of life across the burning desert to those in sinful strife. And though it be my lot to bear my colors there, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Just heaven to me, wherever I may be, if he is there. I 
count it a privilege here His cross to bear If Jesus goes with me, I'll go But if it be my portion to bear my cross at home While others bear their burdens beyond the built home I'll prove my faith in Him who face His judgments fair And if He stays with me, I'll stay anywhere If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere It's heaven to me wherever I may be if He I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. It is not mine to question the judgments of my Lord. It is but mine to follow the leadings of his word. But if to go or stay, or whether here or there, I'll be with my Savior content anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, wherever I may be, if he is there. I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go just have a word of prayer together tonight and start our services. I want to welcome you this evening. Thank you for coming out and being here on what's been a great day. It's been a beautiful day and uh, I think this weekend they say the trees are going to just be at their uh, peak. I think they're nicer than they've been the last few years and uh, just what a beautiful week it's been. So uh, we're thankful for all those things. Thankful for God's goodness to us and the opportunity we have to come and be in the services. Thank you for being here and it's just a privilege to have you. And uh, we just want to pray together. Just start our services off here tonight. And uh, let's just look to Him and uh, just trust Him. Father, we are thankful for a great day that you've allowed us to have. Thank you for your goodness. Uh, thank you, Father, for your love and your grace. And God, the mercy that you have had upon our lives. And thank you, Father, that you demonstrated these things when you allowed your Son to take our place on the cross, die a death that we were deserving of. And Lord, we thank you that we can have eternal life and abundant life in Christ. Thank you for the privilege we have of coming here and being in this service tonight. We just pray you'll bless, uh, Lord, all that's done across our property, Lord, just the uh, the, the youth group and the the Children's Bible Club, and thank you for all of our faithful bus workers, and Lord, thank you for the children's ministry teachers and workers and you staff, and thank you for those that are assembled here tonight, and what, Lord, is just one of the most encouraging services of our week, and so we come tonight, Lord, just to hear from you, to be encouraged, and Lord, just to be strengthened, and God, to be reminded that, Lord, the great work of Christianity, the work of the church is to be done, Lord, through uh, those days of the week, each day of our life, looking for opportunities to live for you, to serve you, uh, just to demonstrate, Lord, your uh, life and to, to uh, point others to Christ. And what well, we just pray that now between now and the weekend, we'll be uh, looking to invite others to attend and Lord, praying, God, that your work just be done here, Lord, in this place and in our community. So we thank you for this time we have together. Bless all that's done tonight, Lord. Thank you for the singing. And uh, Lord, we look to you to have your hand upon the word of God. And Lord, just touch and change our lives to be like Christ and to be usable to you. We ask you to meet the needs of people that are in our service tonight. Lord, we know that you love them. And God, that you care for them. And God, you have the provision that they need. So let us draw close to you and we'll thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. And again, thank you for being here tonight. And uh, we do have uh, a prayer bulletin. And uh, if you have a copy of that, then uh, you can open that up and look inside there and see at some of the many things that, uh, that you can pray for. And uh, we hope that you pray about these ministries every week. And uh, on uh, October the 25th, there's a uh, special day at the OU campus when they allow all the uh, clubs and organizations that are on the campus to kind of assemble together in their, uh, in their uh, uh, community area and uh, put a display out and try to invite and encourage 
uh, students to be involved in that particular club or organization. And so we're planning on being there from 10 to 2 on that day, October 25th. I hope you'll pray about that day. And we're going to be there with some special materials and flyers and some, uh, uh, some visual things that we're going to have on our table uh, just to try to encourage uh, the students that are on the campus down at OU to drop in and see us. Uh, we've been encouraged here as we're getting ready to start. We've had some email contact with some students, and uh, they're interested in coming and being a part and seeing what they can do to help. So uh, we're looking forward to just getting that uh, started and, uh, and uh, getting, uh, uh, getting ready to go down there. So I uh, hope you'll be praying about that. And then all of our other things there were uh, also just uh, encouraged by. I hope you'll be praying about each one of them. And uh, what a privilege it is we can be involved in these things. Uh, I hope you'll be here for Sunday school. Sunday school is one of the most important uh, things that you can be involved in in your local church. And we just study God's Word together. God's Word makes the difference. By faith, uh, we know that we've come to know the Lord, and that faith came by hearing the Word of God. And we grow in our likeness to Christ through the Word of God and our knowledge of Him. So it's an important thing. Uh, Brother Evan here in the auditorium is teaching through the book of Hosea, and uh, the title of their lesson this week is Unaware. And uh, we've been looking at about 10 lessons on our enemy, our adversary, the devil. And uh, we're looking at uh, this coming week, Satan's downfall. Uh, what, what, uh, what, was the, what was the issues that, uh, that, uh, that uh, happened uh, in the past, uh, that has, uh, has Satan in the situation that he is in today, and what will be his destiny. And we're going to be looking at those things, and I'm thankful I'm on the winning side. I know the Lord is my Savior. Uh, I know what's going to happen to the devil someday, and uh, I can't wait to see it. And uh, I'd love to be able to just step up there and just give him a good swift kick right in the hind quarters, wouldn't you? And just send him right on over into the lake of fire. And now uh, that's where he's going to go. You know, he's headed there. And uh, so uh, we're thankful for uh, God's word. So we're going to be studying that this coming Sunday morning. Uh, at the bottom of the list there, we've got uh, several names of folks that are on our prayer list and different things that we hope you'll be praying about. And uh, one of the families we hope you'll pray for is Miss Kathy Mitchell's family. Uh, just, uh, just heartbreaking. Sunday morning after church, she went out, checked a message on her phone in her car, found out that her sister passed away uh, Sunday morning. And uh, just a shock, just an unexpected thing. A uh, sister that's just a little older than Kathy. And uh, they have her viewing tonight. Her funeral, the services for that uh, lady are tomorrow. 11 o'clock, it's all in Wheelersburg, uh, so uh, be praying for Miss Kathy. It was a shock for her, and uh, her family, and her sisters are very close, and so just pray for them and just remember her in prayer. Maybe you have somebody else that you'd like to put on our prayer list tonight or something you'd like for us to pray for. Anybody have anything tonight? Yes, let's be sure we're praying for him. Brother Fred McClure. God's blessed him with grace and patience, long-suffering attitude. It's Kathy's dad. <laughs> Just kidding. Amen. Pray for him. Anybody else have someone you'd like to put on there? Yes. Okay. All right. And his name? Ronald Gothard. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. And uh, keep praying there for uh, Charlie Cade. He had surgery and went real well. And uh, he started uh, started therapy on Monday. And uh, they don't uh, they uh, they were able to do the repair work via a scope, just making a couple incisions. And then behind his knee, he had a tear in one of those muscles. And so they were able to go in there and repair that. But uh, on Monday, they got him up and they started therapy and all those things. He's doing real well. He's on his own now. If Donna went back to work, she took off a few days to help him and watch out for him. But he's on his own now. So uh, he's doing good, though, and appreciates everybody praying for him. 
he hopes to be able to be back here on Sunday and be back with us. So uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, anybody else have something you want to put on there? Oh. Um, but that first day before we leave, we're going to Northern Target, and then that week will be Cross Day, and so just to be with them and to really talk to them each and every week. Okay. 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 There's a family. Uh, from this community, well, uh, the, the man is, uh, his name is Zach Hiberlin. He's a missionary to China. He and his wife, uh, the Hiberlins, Zach was uh, saved and attended Mamre Baptist Church. Chuck was their pastor for a long time. And uh, he went to school and married a wonderful young lady. They've been in China as missionaries. Uh, they teach in a school, but uh, the primary reason they're there is they they are working in underground churches in China, and uh, they will uh, uh, they will take Bibles and distribute Bibles within the country in a covert type of way, and they've been doing a great work reaching a lot of people for the Lord in China. Uh, just recently, uh, his wife has been diagnosed with a very serious type of cancer, and uh, they've had to fly uh, back from China to the States in just an emergency type situation and uh, just young family serving the Lord and living for God and uh, uh, just uh, right now just exemplifying a very gracious spirit and uh, testimony of faith in the Lord that God's doing a work and uh, so we just want to pray for them the Hebrews just remember them in prayer and uh, God will just minister to them and continue to give them the grace they need to um, keep following uh, here the steps that the Lord has for them. Anybody else have something tonight? Only 47 percent. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, and that's of any any type. Yeah. So you could you could you could do do some more math on that and whittle that thing even down farther. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're at a crucial time in our country's history. And a lot of people are marking November the 4th, that's the Sunday before our elections, uh, as a, just a national day of prayer among God's people, just encouraging God's people to pray and uh, just look to the Lord and just uh, ask God to intervene in hearts and lives. And uh, It's going to take a work of God, isn't it? And uh, uh, we hope you'll be praying as well about those things. This coming Sunday, uh, we'll get uh, to the back page of our bulletin in a moment, but this coming Sunday, I'm going to begin uh, to preach uh, about four messages on this subject, four sins that will bring down any nation, four sins that will bring down any nation. When you study the nation of Israel, you know that they were a nation that was elevated to a higher place than any other nation on planet earth. And God brought them lower than any other nation on planet Earth. And they still are not, they're still not out from under that. And there were four primary sins that God said, that's the line, I'm drawing the line, and repent and turn back to me and forsake those things or I'm going to judge you. And those four sins are prevalent in our country today. And they have been for a long time. And so I hope you'll be here the next few Sundays, and we're going to look at that. Four sins that bring down any nation. Uh, we'll begin that on Sunday morning. But uh, we are at a crucial time, and uh, we certainly need to be in prayer about these things. Amen. Uh, anybody else have something you want to put on our prayer list? 
Right. Well, we want to pray together here and just look to the Lord and lift these names up and uh, folks on this prayer list that we have recorded there already or people that need uh, just need uh, uh, various and different things. But we're thankful God's able to meet those needs. And so we're going to just continue to trust the Lord for them and pray and just believe God. And uh, we just look to the Lord. Thank Him for answering prayer. And uh, uh, what, a, what a blessing that is. But let's take a moment and let's just look to the Lord and have a word of prayer together. And we'll just ask God to minister to us here this evening. Uh, Brother Ken, just lead us in prayer, please. <clears throat> Yes, yes. 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 Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. On the back there, you'll notice, of course, one of the things we're uh, looking forward to is our Hallelujah Festival. That's coming up next Tuesday night, and uh, that's from 6 to 7.30, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, we still can use plenty of volunteers. If maybe you haven't signed up on that list to give us a hand, uh, we need your help with that. Uh, just let us know after the service. Uh, we still need candy. Can't have too much of that, so uh, bring some candy in on Sunday, and uh, or if you can't make it out somewhere to... to get candy if you'd like to just give a monetary donation mark it that way we'll be sure to go and pick that up for you but uh, we need uh, plenty of candy and then Sunday night we'll start setting some things up and getting ready so we could use some help with that after the service on Sunday night but uh, we look forward to it. it's just a great way we can try to reach our community do something uh, nice for families and for children and then just help uh, folks to get to know us a little bit better and, and uh, have uh, folks that we can contact with and follow back up on uh, as well. So that'll be coming up here uh, next Tuesday. Uh, then we want you to make uh, our faith promise.
promise and our uh, mission uh, uh, support uh, a matter of prayer also. We, of course, had a great mission revival, and uh, during the revival, we try to receive faith promise cards and uh, just uh, allow our church family to communicate to us what uh, God's wanting to do through your family this coming year for world missions and evangelism. And uh, right now, we're still short on that. So we, uh, we know that there are some folks who don't uh, turn in a card, but they're faithful to give. Uh, we, you know, it seems like the, the past month, we had a lot of folks just not able to be here or be in services, and they were here Sunday, so uh, they'll get back on track and get back into church and uh, be able to fill out their cards and get them turned in. But we do want to make that a matter of prayer and just trust the Lord to use our lives to make up the difference. And uh, we'll see how things go this month and what our actual uh, offerings are for faith promise. And uh, and if, uh, if they're still not where they need to be, we'll just have to have a special day of just prayer and, and just uh, ask God to uh, give us the faith we need to all do just a little bit more. We don't want to have to back up or back down on our, fifth, on our faith promise and missions. And uh, so we hope that you'll just make that a matter of prayer and ask the Lord to give you faith to uh, be able to do what uh, God would have you to do uh, financially for missions. Uh, help us on Saturday mornings. We need anyone and everyone that can come out around 10 o'clock and go out and help us finish off a few areas in the uh, community that we have marked off where we've been going door to door, just passing out a gospel booklet, giving them an invitation to church and uh, just trying to make contact with families and people in our community, let them know about our church. And uh, we hope you'll help us out. Uh, we uh, got a good uh, window of opportunity to do that over the next four to six weeks, and then it's going to start getting rough to be outside, uh, but we need your help. We could finish it real easily if we had a good group out for a couple Saturdays, and uh, we could get that finished up and uh, go together in groups and, and uh, get take that taken care of. So if you can make it out, husbands and wives can come, or ladies can get together and go, uh, men, uh, whatever the situation, just come on out and help us out Saturdays at 10. And then the ladies' retreat is coming up November 16th and 17th. Don't forget about that. And uh, I've not been able to get to go. I uh, usually like to go and drive one of the vans and help the ladies get down there and back. I haven't been able to do that the last couple of years because of uh, conflicts with some other things at Lydia School. And uh, I'm thankful this year because it's in November, I'm going to be able to go. So I'm looking forward to that and uh, getting forward to get back down there and and uh, see, see some friends and, and uh, visit uh, back in Newport. So I hope all the ladies have a brochure on that. And if you have any questions about the retreat, uh, let us know. And uh, we'll be sure to answer those questions for you. But I encourage you to fill them out and turn them in just as soon as you possibly can. Well, we ask our men to come tonight. We'll receive our tithes and our offerings and our Faith Promise Missions offerings. Don't forget there are some flyers back there on the way out the back door about the Hallelujah Festival, so take some of those, if you will, and pass them out and get the word out. Invite some folks in your family or your neighborhood uh, to come out and be a part of that, and uh, we look forward to it. Our men will pray, and we'll receive our offering tonight. Our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Thank you now once again for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we just pray that you would use these tithes and offerings, Lord, to bring honor and praise and glory and, and the growing of the kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
On Wednesday nights, we always like to give folks an opportunity maybe just to share a word of testimony or uh, just a verse of scripture that's been a blessing to you or just something that uh, God's encouraged you about and uh, we can be uh, thankful for on a Wednesday night and uh, we always like to give folks a little opportunity to do that. If you want to go ahead in your Bibles and be turning them open to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we will, but uh, if you have something you'd like to share, uh, we hope you just feel free to do that. Amen. Good. We're glad you're here too. Amen. 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 <laughs> That's great, isn't it? Praise the Lord. There are just several confirmations of God's goodness and thank Thank the Lord there. Amen. Good. Praying for the Lord back and forth for me to start coming and never do the same thing. Yeah. Okay, good. Amen. 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 Anyone else? Well, in Ecclesiastes, we've been looking there just for a couple weeks at, uh, at the beginning of this book. Twelve chapters is all that the book of Ecclesiastes is, but uh, it's certainly a very uh, important and a very relevant book for our lives. Uh, you know, we talked last week how God's Word is, uh, we can divide it up a little bit so that we can more readily understand what uh, portions of God's Word are focusing on. We know those first five books of the Bible are books that contain the law of Moses and the law of God, and then we find those historical books that give us a record and a history of the uh, of the judges and the kings of Israel and uh, and the increase in the growth of their nation. And then we move into the, uh, into the latter part of the Old Testament and we begin to read the great, uh, great ministries that God uh, did through the lives of those prophets, the major prophets and the minor prophets and how they delivered uh, the word of God. What thus saith the Lord... Uh, to a people uh, that needed to hear the Word of God. And then in the New Testament, we have the Gospel records. We have that transitional book of Acts that moves us from uh, the infant church uh, to the empowered church and then into the uh, epistles to the churches, the pastoral letters that help us uh, understand the doctrine, the polity, and the methods of the local church and the New Testament church. And uh, we find all of these different uh, types of, uh, of books uh, all together, the Bible said, are all inspired and profitable to us. And then in the middle of your Bible, right in the heart of your Bible, you have the books that deal with the heart of man. Beginning in the book of Job, the book of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. These are books that don't uh, necessarily deal with the laws or uh, kings or uh, necessarily uh, of, of nations or uh, wars, these types of things. But what they do uh, deal with are the hearts of men. There's one thing that has never changed, and that's the heart of men. And we find that God's Word addresses the needs in our hearts and life. When you come to the book of Ecclesiastes, we are studying the uh, empty life uh, that uh, men experience without God. Uh, the emptiness of life without God. And here in lesson number one, we have heard a remarkable statement by a man, the Bible says, in uh, verse number one of Ecclesiastes 1, who was the king in Jerusalem. He makes this statement in verse two, Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Here the king in Jerusalem, a man uh, that we know is the, uh, is the king uh, whose name is Solomon, makes an amazing statement. He says, I am a man whose life is empty. 
I have an empty life. Uh, the word vanity means emptiness. All is empty, empty uh, without uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in his life where he should be. An emptiness that nothing but uh, fellowship and a relationship with God can feel. Uh, and we know that uh, he goes on there to tell us uh, over in Second uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 uh, in verse number 17 that he hated his life. What a statement from this man. I hated life. Now, last week we looked at this first thought that here was a man who had everything. We said it would be easy to understand and believe this statement if it were someone who, who maybe uh, did not have a home to live in, who did not uh, maybe have, uh, uh, have uh, food uh, that was always readily available. Uh, maybe a man who had no family or anyone in this earth that he could call a friend. Maybe that uh, would be someone we could understand making a statement like that. I'm empty. My life is meaningless. Uh, I have no one uh, who loves or cares about me. My life is, uh, is, is, is empty and I hate life. But it's more difficult when it's a king, isn't it? Especially a man like Solomon. Here was a man who had everything, and we find that he was a privileged man. He was the king of, at that time, the greatest nation on the face of the earth. He was a powerful man who held the power of life and death in his own hands. Here was a man who, uh, who was a, a prominent man, who uh, sat on the throne of Israel, and he was a man who possessed any and everything that he could possibly ever desire. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 2.10 that whatsoever his eyes desired, he kept not from them. Whatever he desired to possess, he possessed. Here was a man who was prosperous. Not only did he uh, come into and possess what his father David had left him, but he was a prosperous man. Uh, the things that he did in the world and of the world prospered by the standards of the world. He was a prosperous man, a privileged, powerful, prominent man, and yet he made that statement, I hate life. And, you know, uh, we understand today that, that this, is a, this is testimony against all that believe that if we can just add things to our life, that that's going to be what satisfies us and that's what makes us happy. Because we can't look to any man who had more of anything than Solomon had. And yet he said, my life was empty. And I hated the life that I had. Now, I want you to notice a second thing tonight. Uh, he had everything, but he did make this statement that his life was an empty life. There in uh, verse number uh, 2 of chapter 1, he makes the statement about emptiness and uh, uh, how all that he sees in his life is empty. Uh, empty is this idea of, uh, of something that's elusive and uh, it's almost as if uh, it's like a vapor and you think you have your hands uh, about ready to grasp what's going to solve all your problems and satisfy you completely but when it's in your grasp it just slips through your fingers and it leaves you uh, with that uh, sense of dissatisfaction and that sense of, uh, of not being satisfied or fulfilled and, and everything that Solomon turned to that he thought was the next uh, thing that would satisfy uh, left him with empty hands, not finding that which truly brought joy to his life or brought a sense of purpose or satisfaction. Uh, he, he was in the, uh, in the midst of, uh, of an elusive search for that which had meaning in his life. When you take inventory and look at the man Solomon, uh, he was a brilliant man. The Bible speaks about his wisdom as being legendary. God said there wasn't a wiser man who lived on planet earth except from the Lord Jesus Christ when he was here. You can go back in your Bible sometime and read in 1 Kings chapter 3, one of those uh, just great examples that we have there of Solomon and his uh, great wisdom that he has. And uh, here uh, we find in 1 Kings chapter 3 beginning in verse number 5, the Bible says in, in Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and God said, ask what I shall give thee. God said, I've signed a check, Solomon, it's blank. You fill in the blank. Whatever you want, you ask of me and I'll give it to you. 
Verse 6 says, And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father. And I am but a little child. I, I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee, all thy days. What a great, what a great transaction transpired there between Solomon and God. And Solomon became a wise and a brilliant man. He not only became a wise man, but he became a very educated man. Solomon was a great architect. Some of the structures that he designed and had built became wonders of the world at that time. Nothing had ever been built like them. Nothing uh, had ever been seen like some of the things that he did. He became a zoologist and brought within uh, the city of Jerusalem uh, animals and different types of, uh, of living things uh, into that city that the, that part of the world had never seen before. He became a great botanist and planted gardens and the hanging gardens of Solomon. and uh, Some of the things that you find there are, are, are unequaled in the history of the world and he became successful in everything that he had and and he became wise and and uh, he became prosperous and yet all of those things left him empty an emptiness that he could not feel he had everything but his life was empty and the third thing I want you to notice as we just begin in this first chapter is there was nothing on earth that could satisfy him there's a statement I told you there in, in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 that you'll read over 25 times in these short 12 chapters, and it's in the third verse. Solomon asked this question, What profit hath the man of all of his labor, which he taketh under the sun? That phrase, under the sun, re is repeated 25 times. What that does is it focuses our attention on life in this world. Life under the sun. Life on this side of eternity. While we live, while we have life in this world, Solomon wants us to ask the question, what does all of our labor, the lifetime labor of a man, what's it really profit you? If you gain, get, and have everything the world has to offer you, and yet you find out it leaves you empty. That's a life lived and labor invested that pays no return. And Solomon found that to be true in his life at that point. What, 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 what can satisfy? Nothing on earth could satisfy him. And he had everything this world had. You can mark in your Bibles there and maybe make a reference back to 2 Peter in the third chapter. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we read about what God has already written about what's going to happen to this world and everything that's in this world. This world is headed for a day when all that it is and all that it contains are going to be destroyed. 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says, beginning down in the, in the seventh verse, But the heavens and earth which are now by the same word kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Someday God is going to speak and this world is going to disintegrate. The same God who will speak that word is also at this very moment by His own will and word 
continuing and keeping this world moving on just as it is right now. Someday the word of God will see to the destruction of this world. He says in the 8th verse, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Doesn't it cross your mind, and maybe now with more frequency than it ever has before, Lord, how long can you let this world continue on? How long? How long? In a country that uh, is historically a Christian nation, and yet, as Brother Bob mentioned, a survey, 40, uh, under 50% of the people in this country profess to have any affiliation with a religious organization. How long can God allow this to continue? Why would God long be so long-suffering? Well, here it is. He's not willing that men should perish. He's not willing that men should perish. We live in a world today that wants to point their finger at God as the problem. That it's God's fault that this world is suffering, that there's so much sorrow, sickness, so much uh, need that's in the world. And yet men do not realize that it's the goodness and grace of God that allows them to live one more day, that they in their ignorance might come to the knowledge of the truth, that they might be moved from the darkness to the light, that they might receive Jesus Christ as their Savior before it's eternally too late. And they never realize the grace and goodness of a long-suffering Savior. It's not the fault of God the way this world is. It's the fault of men and our sin that has brought all the sorrow that there is in this world. All the suffering has been caused by our sin, by our nature that's depraved and set as selfish and, and desiring to have its own way. And yet God loves men and He wants men to repent. Verse 10 says, but, but the day of the Lord will come. As a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for... New heavens, plural, and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. We know this world and everything that it has is headed for a day of destruction. You know, we're mistaken when we equate material possessions with the presence of the blessings of God. That makes sense? Sometimes we look at the world and we look at what people possess and what they have, and we equate that with being in the will of God and having the blessings of God. And we couldn't be any farther from the truth. I shared with you the story about the little woman uh, in the church I pastored in Tennessee who had nothing, absolutely nothing of this world and all of its goods and yet she had the Lord Jesus in a relationship with Him that was worth more and more valuable than anything this world could offer. And there are so many today, and if we're not careful, we look at the prosperity of the wicked, and we look at the prosperity of the world, and we feel like, God, why are you blessing them? And here I am struggling along and barely making it. I can tell you what, I believe the closer we are to the Lord, the more difficult the world will make it upon us. The more uh, challenging uh, will be the trials and the tests that are set before us as we walk near the Lord in fellowship in, uh, with Him uh, in His sufferings. But we cannot make that mistake. There, uh, you know, uh, if that were true, then those uh, who do not have material things are not being blessed and living right. And we know that's not right either. We know that's not right. And uh, uh, all uh, it makes it all the more satisfying uh, in our lives to live simply satisfied with what we have, but knowing we have the Lord Jesus Christ above all. 
and know that uh, what we have in Christ can never be taken away and uh, that we might live and labor with our life and energy to be more like the Lord and to please Him. Those ought to be the things that are at the top of our priority list. I was talking today with some folks and we were just discussing uh, how uh, topsy-turvy our world is. Uh, the things that, uh, that the world values and prioritizes are on the bottom when it comes to the economic system of God. And the things that God values and places high priority on, the world has that at the bottom of their list. But we're thankful today that we can know uh, Christ, live for Him and serve Him, and uh, not, uh, not live to have the things of the world, because we know that there's nothing in this world that can satisfy this King. He had everything, and yet his life was empty, and he found nothing on earth that could satisfy him. And we must not ever forget that we're only moving through this life, and uh, the things that we possess in this world uh, are going to remain in this world. Uh, the only thing we can keep for eternity are the things we send ahead by serving God, living for Him, and investing in the kingdom of God. And things in this world will not satisfy. And let me just give you this last thing. Uh, we men are made for eternity. If you, if you live in this world and miss that, you're going to have an emptiness that will never be satisfied and the things of the world will never satisfy you. If you miss this reality, we're made for eternity. Back in the little book of 1 John, in chapter number 2, 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 15, Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. God has made men with a spirit, a soul, and a body. The Bible said we're made in the image and likeness of our God. Our God is a triune being. He's God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. All, uh, all existing at the same time. All co-powerful, co-equal, co-existent. And in that trinity, God made man. He made man with a body. He made man with a spirit that... Uh, that capacity uh, for that spirit to be quickened in a man to know and to have a relationship with God and he's given all men a soul the soul of a man is who he is the soul of a man is eternal when God breathed into man the breath of life he breathed into man life that will uh, that will continue eternally and uh, we know today that, uh, that sin has, uh, has, uh, has separated man from God. To live without God and to die without God is to spend an eternity without God. But to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our saviors is to know Him and to live and abide with Him forever. But God made man and He made man for eternity. Our, our bodies can be pampered and our uh, souls might feel at ease and... And we might accept ourselves as we are, but if we neglect uh, that part of our lives, that spirit which must be quickened, that, that connection of God's life with our life, then we're going to be empty people. Empty. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are quickened when we are saved and we're made alive unto God. But without Him, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. And we must give attention to the life of God, which, uh, which He desires to have within our hearts and lives. If we live long enough, we'll drive by places, maybe a building, maybe, maybe a home, maybe some other type of structure, and we'll, we'll remember when these things were choice when those things were the most desirable places in town. But you drive by now and they're derelict. So now we have a much different thought. Now our thought is, why don't they tear that place down? It's an eyesore. It's been let go. No one's given attention to it. 
It's not worth anything anymore. It's not usable anymore. It's old. It's decayed. It's going to be cast away. And we know that heaven and earth are passing away. This, this world we live in and all it is, and when you lift your eyes up and everything you can see, someday it's all going to be dissolved. The Bible tells us in Philippians there, the third chapter of the book of Philippians, Philippians 3 and beginning down there in verse number 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul said, uh, and, and you can go back up and read the entire first six chapters of, or verses of chapter 3. And Paul tells you a little bit about his life, about his history, about his stock and breeding and his position in this world. At least in the eyes of men and in the position that this world would hold him in. And Paul was at the top. But he said, everything that I might have been without the Lord... I would be at a loss if I chose to keep all of that and miss having the Lord Jesus Christ. I would be the loser. Though I had all those things, I would be at a loss without Christ. And, uh, uh, and he goes on there to talk about the excellency of having the knowledge of Christ Jesus, his Lord. He says, yes, I've suffered the loss of all things. You can go and continue to read about the life of the Apostle Paul. and You can read about the trials he went through. You can read of the suffering. You can read of the persecution of Paul. Uh, you can read of, uh, of all, the, uh, all, all the challenges and things that he faced. Uh, history tells us that Paul went bravely uh, out and met the executioner that uh, took his head and removed it from his body and he left this world to go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul uh, spent the last part of his life in a prison cell. He had nothing of this world's goods and yet he said uh, that, he, uh, that he gave them all away and counted everything that he could have had but dung in comparison with having and knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. And you know, today we might have everything the world has to offer, but uh, we're going to find out that it's going to never satisfy us. And in fact, uh, it's going to be temporal and be destroyed and taken away while our souls will exist for eternity. And the thing that men need more than anything is to know the Lord Jesus Christ. To know Him, to not know Him, and have everything the world can offer is a loss. It's a loss. But to have Christ, maybe not have much in this world, is to have everything that's going to mean anything a million years from now. So we're thankful today for, uh, for God's Word. And we're going to finish there that first lesson, that first kind of introduction now to this, uh, this great book. And uh, next week we'll move right ahead and, and uh, begin again here to study and to look at some of the truths that we're going to find as we think about the emptiness of life uh, without God. Amen. We'll stop right there. We're going to pray together tonight and just look to the Lord. And uh, we always encourage people, if they have a need tonight uh, to pray, feel free to pray and come if you need a place to pray and pray uh, at this altar. It won't bother a thing. Uh, if you're here tonight and maybe don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, we don't know that. We just want to ask that. Uh, make that uh, statement so that you can know that if you'd like to have someone take God's word, show you from the scripture what it means to trust Christ and be saved, uh, that we would be glad to do that. But we want to pray together this evening, and let's just look to the Lord. We'll be dismissed here and finished up. Lord, we do thank you for how good you are to us. Thank you for the word of God, and thank you for this great illustration that we have of the life of this man Solomon. God, uh, here's a life and a man that we can... We can, uh, Lord, use uh, the examples of his life to help us. God, I can't tell you enough how many times I've needed to consider, uh, Lord, uh, where Solomon found himself. Lord, whenever I begin to consider or think about uh, maybe the things that I don't have or the, uh, or, the, uh, or the position and circumstances of life, Lord, I only need to look to a man like him who had all that maybe I feel like I deserve or ought to have. And yet, Lord, he was empty. 
And Lord, we just pray today you'd help us, God, to realize and appreciate our relationship with you. God, that we'd desire above all that we'd be in fellowship with you and know you daily, Lord, and have a real relationship with you that God will transcend all the circumstances and situations of life that'll take all the, all the haves and make them lost without you. And so, Lord, we just pray tonight you'd help us, God, to not, not be discouraged and not to be, uh, Lord, uh, this, uh, deceived as we look at the prosperity of the world and the riches of the lost and those who give you no regard. But, God, help us to know and realize that the most important thing that we can have is, uh, is to know you as our Savior and that, Lord, uh, when we're in eternity, that's the thing that's going to make the difference. Bless your people tonight. Meet their needs in this world. You promised you would do that as we seek first the kingdom of God, the further it, and to support and serve and live and labor, that your word might go forth and you might be glorified. And Lord, we just pray, God, you'd just make us content, Lord, to have enough uh, that, God, we might be able to continue just to live for you and to serve you. And Lord, we just ask God now you bless uh, the people that are here, meet their needs, Lord, help them and care for them. And Lord, we pray we'd be about your work now between now and the Lord's day. Uh, Lord, help us to encourage people to come, invite people, pray, uh, pass out invitations, and get God's word out through gospel tracts and God through our own lives. And so, Lord, we pray that we'd be found living and laboring for you. And Lord, we just ask God you'd do a work in our lives, our church, that would magnify you and glorify you. And we'll just thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen.
Young